We are FBC Summit, leading everyday people to love Jesus and make Him known. Thank you so much for joining us today. Here's our pastor, Dr. Larry LeBlanc. Australia is moving. I don't know if you have heard the news or you have seen, but just since 1994, a relatively short amount of time, the entire continent of Australia has moved over five feet. That's a long way for an entire continent to move, but probably if you're like me, when you first read that, you thought, well, in the scheme of things, a continent moving five feet, that's really not that far. But I want you to think about how we, how much we use GPS these days. Think about what five feet would make a difference when everything is coordinated according to mapping. As the continent continues to move, it, it makes mapping the continent, it, it makes the GPS coordinates increasingly difficult to keep updated. And it's crazy when you think about that the very things that seem like that they're unmovable, that they're unshakable, that there's no way that they could shift something exactly like a continent, that it would be moving even as we speak. When you look at the world around us, it's pretty obvious that things are constantly in flux. Change seems to be the only thing that doesn't change. And so in the midst of that, we come to a place in our lives where we find ourselves asking, what is it that's unmovable? What are the things that are unchangeable? What are the foundations? Today we're going to begin a brand new seven-week series journeying through the book of Titus. We're going to look at what godly leadership in an ungodly world really looks like. And there is no better study to understand that than the book of Titus. And today specifically, we're going to look at the foundations that should undergird all of our lives, leadership included, about what are the unmovable foundations. As you're turning there with me to the book of Titus chapter 1 and verse 1, just to give you a little bit of background about what's going on as Paul writes this letter. It was the second to last letter that Paul ever wrote, the last letter being 2 Timothy. And as he picks up and writes this letter, he's writing it to a man that he knows and knows well, a fellow pastor by the name of Titus. We believe that Paul probably led Titus to the Lord during his second missionary journey. They ministered together extensively. It is an understatement to say that they were close friends. They spent over a year together just in Corinth. And Paul had left him on the island of Crete, which is in the Mediterranean Sea, the island of Crete is about 160 miles long, and yet there were a significant number of believers on the island of Crete. They were scattered about all throughout the island, and it was Titus that was sent to oversee this group of believers. It would be a legitimate question to ask, how did the believers ever get to Crete? Most scholars believe that when Pentecost took place, that there were those from Crete who were there in Jerusalem and heard the gospel preached in their own native tongue, and they got radically and powerfully saved. One of the events that happened at Pentecost was the people not only came to Pentecost, but they went back to their homes. And when they went back to their homes, they went back changed, and they went back with the gospel. And as they go back to Crete, these churches are popping up all along this 160-mile island, and there's a significant number of believers now in Crete that spread out. So for Paul to leave Titus in charge of this ministry, it is because he has a supreme confidence in him. Now, if you read Titus, and it sounds a lot like First and, Timothy, First and Second Timothy, you're right in that observation because they're both written to encourage and strengthen in the midst of trials and, oppos and opposition because Paul is passing the torch of leadership. Paul realizes, as he said in Timothy, that he is already being poured out like a drink offering, that the time has come for his departure is what he told Timothy. So when you think about Timothy and Titus, you're thinking about men who Paul has invested in mightily, who Paul now knows that I'm about to leave this earth, and it is going to be because of men like Titus and men like Timothy that the work of God is going to continue to carry on. So as we read it together over the next several weeks, you can hear the urgency in Paul's voice even as he writes. You can see that, that these last words that he is pinning are words to him that we have to get right, that are the very foundations of godly leadership in an ungodly world. He writes this not only to encourage and strengthen these men, 
but it's also designed to build strong churches that are effective in evangelism and instruction and to present a guide to ministry and to personal holiness. If you've never spent a great deal of time in this little book of Titus, I want to challenge you over the weeks ahead to read it and reread it. And you're going to find a treasure trove of theological beauty as we walk through this book together. So let's begin our study by standing and reading the Word of God. Titus chapter 1, and we begin in verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, a faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. And at his appointed season, he brought his word to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior, to Titus, my true son in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and from Christ Jesus our Savior. Lord, teach us today that there are foundational elements that must guide our lives and our ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. There are foundational elements that must guide our life in ministry. These are the foundations that we can't get wrong. Sometimes as we read through an introduction, we'll blow through the introduction to try to get to the beginning of the letter. But if you blow through these four verses, you miss what is foundational, not only to the book of Titus, but what is foundational to all ministry, what is foundational to the church. These are elements that are, non, that are absolute essentials, non-negotiables of the faith. And, and so let's jump right in to figure out what are these foundational elements. Number one, number one is identity identity. Paul says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. A servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. There are two ways that Paul identifies himself in this letter, and it's foundational. The first thing he says is that he is a servant, and the second thing he says is he is an apostle. When he said he is a servant, the word there is doulos. It is actually better translated that he is a slave, that he is completely in service to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that when it comes to Christ, he is a slave of Christ, that everything he does and all that he is is committed to being a slave, to doing whatever God wants him to do and that's how he lived his life. He said that he's an apostle. You'll remember in Acts chapter 9, this beautiful Damascus Road conversion experience of Paul's in which Jesus Christ called him into ministry. And Paul says, I want to give you my identity. I want everyone who is hearing this letter to know who I am. You see, one of the reasons for this letter was not just to encourage Timothy and not just to give the church practical help, but it was also so the churches, when they read this, would recognize Titus's authority, that they would recognize and say, yes, Titus is not only a good leader, but he's also got Paul's red stamp. Paul believes in him. So Paul starts out with his credentials. Now, it's interesting because we know biblically who Paul was, what, could have, what he could have said. In fact, if you go all the way to Philippians chapter 3, you see what Paul could have said. He gives this huge list of, if he was to give his resume, what Paul would be able to say. Paul says, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. He says, I I'm purebred. My mother was a Hebrew. My father was a Hebrew, and I'm a Hebrew. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. There's no tribe that could be better than where I am from. As for knowledge, I am a Pharisee. As for zeal, I have the most. When you look back at who Paul was, his learning, his experience, his education, who he knew, where he had been, if he were to give a resume like we give resumes today, it would take longer than you have to sit here for this sermon for Paul to be able to tell you all that he had done, all that he had accomplished, and all that was under his belt. But notice he doesn't list any of those things. He only lists two things. He said, what you need to know about me, first and foremost, because these are the only really two things that ought to be my identifiers. Number one, I'm a slave, and number two, I'm an apostle. Now, why is that? Why is that? Very few times when we introduce ourselves, think about how we introduce ourselves. Most of the time we give our name, we might give where we're from, we give what we do for a living. Sometimes we might give our educational background. Sometimes students, we talk about what athletics we play or what, what we're involved with. Sometimes we may even talk about hobbies or music that we like. We give a lot of information. 
But I wonder sometimes if we're not missing it in our introductions. Because if you are saved, if grace truly is greater than all of your sin, if you truly are leaning on the everlasting arms, if He truly is the reason that we sing, if all of those things are true, then when I identify myself and I introduce myself, then you need to know that the most important thing about me is that my name is Larry LeBlanc and I'm saved by the blood of Christ. That I have been saved from my sin, that His grace has forgiven me. And for Paul, what he said after he gave his whole laundry list in Philippians chapter 3, he said, I want you to know all of the things that I just listed, I consider them worthless. In fact, the Greek word there is dung or manure. I consider it all worthless, dung manure none of it means anything in comparison to knowing Christ I want us as a church to understand that the foundational element of your identity is not the color of your skin I want you to understand that the foundation of your identity is not where you're from it's not your educational background it's not your job choice it's not your hobbies it's not your friendships it's not your athletic involvement The most powerful thing about your identity, if you're saved, is that you're blood-bought, is that you're a child of God, and everything else about you falls a dismal, distant second to the fact that at some point in your life, you, like the Apostle Paul, encountered the Lord Jesus. You recognized your sin. You asked Him to forgive you of that sin, believing that He died on the cross and that He rose on the third day, and that now you have been rescued, you have been ransomed, you have been justified, that He is your hope of eternal glory. Nothing else means anything save for the fact that Christ Jesus is my Lord. It's my identity. Amen? I told you this was a rich little book. That's just the identity that Paul gives. But he goes further and he says, but but you need to know not only my identity, we need to know our purpose as well. Our purpose. Look in the second part of that verse. He said, my purpose is, you see that little preposition for, for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. A faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life. Now, when we talk about identity, we're talking about who we are and whose we are. When we talk about purpose, we're talking about why do I exist or simply put, why am I here? And for Paul, he says the number one reason that he's here after he tells his identity, he says, is for the faith of God's elect. The reason that my life, the reason I get up in the morning, the reason I do what I do is because of the gospel. The reason I do what I do is to preach the gospel for the faith of the elect. It is a message that will never be improved upon. In fact, it needs to be a warning to the church today that it is presumptuous, it is dangerous, and it is sinful for anyone to carry a message other than the message of the gospel because it's the only message with eternal power it was then and must be now the number one for the priority for the church and the number one priority for the preacher in other words and we're going to talk more about this throughout the book of Titus but simply put for Paul he has nothing else to say but the gospel the reason that we talk so much about Christ and His resurrection and His death, the reason we talk about justification and sanctification and glorification, the reason it all points towards Jesus, Old Testament and New Testament, the reason that He is the hero of our songs and He is the hero of our prayers and He is the hero of our preaching is because any preaching or instruction that is devoid of Christ and His gospel is not a Christian sermon. And not only will it will not save, but it it has no power. So, so I want to take just a moment here to illustrate the difference. So often what we're hearing are moralistic self-help, and then we call them sermons. Here's how to do it. Here's how to feel better. Here's how to enjoy your life more. Here's how to have a happier marriage. Here's how to have better finances. Here's how to have better spirits. Here's how to get out of anxiety. And oftentimes we're hearing 30 to 45 minute messages that we're allowed to to preach in places that are called churches, but they're devoid of Scripture, they're devoid of Christ, and they're devoid of gospel. And it's sinful. 
It is something that should be repented of. And the reason is, this is why. If that's all we preached, if that's all you were taught, in fact, even if you're ever taught that, here's why, here's why it is sinful. Because if I preach to you moralistic, therapeutic sermons and how-tos, all I have done is created a church of Pharisees. Now, let me explain to you why. What were Pharisees? What did they believe in? They believed in legalism. Well, if you spend all of your time thinking if I do this and I do that, that somehow I'm looking for life improvement, but you never get to the reason why you can do any of those things, the power under which you can do any of those things, the bedrock of why any of that should take place, then what happens is you actually end up with a recipe for frustration because you leave out saying, that's a great idea. I'm going to improve my finances. I'm going to have less anxiety. I'm going to be happier. I'm going to believe in myself. But if you notice after a day, a week, a month, you figure out something, and this is earth shattering because this actually is part of the gospel. You figure out you can't do it. You can't do it. So what the preacher has actually done is giving you a prescription that won't heal you because it's told you that you are the source of your own power. You are the source of your own ability. And it's exactly why it's not a Christian sermon. Because a Christian sermon outside of Jesus and the enabling of the Holy Spirit because of the power of the cross will leave you hellbound Because you will be searching to be able to do something inside your own heart and ability. That if you could have done that, you wouldn't be sitting here anywhere way. You're sitting here in some measure because you recognize that there's not enough strength and power inside you to be able to do it. So for Paul, he says, I'm here because I'm preaching the faith that was entrusted to God's elect to equip and encourage believers. Notice what he says, because it is going to, verse 2, lead to a faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life. Knowledge of truth that leads to godliness. Did you see that? Knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, verse 1. The full counsel of God's Word. If you are saved and you are in God's Word, then you should be being sanctified, becoming more Christ-like all of the time. Now, sanctification takes more than knowledge. But it does not take less than knowledge. You cannot become more sanctified if you don't know and are not continually learning God's Word. By the way, as we talk about godliness and sanctification, oftentimes what we hear people say is, I just wish I could know God's will for my life. Some of us have said that at times in our life. I just wish I knew God's will for my life. If you've been saved for any, any length of time, to make that statement is heretical. To make that statement is doctrinally unsound, and here is why. You can know God's will for your life. If you are in God's Word, under the preaching of God's Word, reading God's Word, studying God's Word, this is God's will for your life. It is presumptuous to believe that God is going to give you the will, His will for your life outside of the Scripture when you're not in the Scripture and God says, if you will place yourself under the Word of God, I've already revealed my will. The problem for most people is not knowing God's will. The problem for most people is obeying God's will. And for Paul, he wants to make sure that they understand that this truth must lead to godliness. The truth must lead to godliness. You see, godliness or genuineness of saving faith is always evidenced by a godly or a holy life. I mentioned to you that I believe that there is apostate pulpits and apostate churches Because the Bible is not preached, Christ is not honored, and the gospel does not take center stage. But I'll tell you, when it comes to godliness, there's also a doctrine that seems to pervade many churches. And I pray it does not pervade this church. 
that somehow it is okay to call yourself a Christian and not strive towards godliness. You have misunderstood the gospel. If you think that you can be saved and not strive towards godliness and holiness, you have misunderstood the gospel. What Paul is saying is that because of the gospel, there should be a desire for holiness. Not to earn the grace of God, because the grace is already what? We sang it this morning, greater than all of our sin. But because the grace is greater than all of our sin, it changes something within me. Not so I would earn the favor of God, but because I have the favor of God, now I desire to be holy. I desire to be godly. That doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. But too many people that call themselves Christians don't care if they're godly. They don't care if they're holy. And I would tell you that is some type of perverted version of the gospel. It has been around for 2,000 years. And what Paul is trying to tell Timothy and wants this church to understand, that any true gospel, will, subsequent to that, will be lives of personal holiness. And he says that this preaching, in verse 3, that this preaching was entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. We've already said that it was to preach for the faith of the elect. And he's preaching to the faith of the elect, and that was entrusted to him by the command of God. I don't spend a lot of time explaining to you the methodology behind the pulpit ministry of this church. Maybe I should spend more time explaining to you that there is a method behind the madness every time that I step to the pulpit of this church. I have convictions that are unwavering in how I desire to lead you and what I believe the call on my life is. There are things that I will have to answer for when God calls me home. And this pulpit is one of the places that gives me fear in my bones. And I don't say that lightly because I would be judged more harshly than any of you will be judged because I've been given a leadership mantle to lead you and preach the gospel to you. And it creates in me a holy fear. There are times in my life where I shudder when I'm preparing messages and I pray in the midst of even preaching them because the worst thing that I could do is not honor the Lord by faithfully preaching his word. I had a conversation this week about where we had been in just recently that we were in Habakkuk for four weeks and we were in Haggai for two weeks and we're going to be seven weeks in the little book of Titus and we put a year in Romans and two years in Luke and all that goes with that. And I know sometimes for some of you, you may wonder, why do we do it like that? Are there other ways to do it? Sure, people do it other ways, but I'm never going to do it another way. And here's why. Because I'm the one that has to stand before God one day and to give an account of the works done while in the flesh. And the only way I know to faithfully carry out the ministry that God has given me, entrusted me with the faith of the elect. Did you see that? Is to preach the instruction of the gospel and to preach the full counsel of the word of God. We go verse by verse, book by book, New Testament, Old Testament, epistles. We go from prophecy to poetry. We go all over the word of God in our attempt to journey through it. And the reason is, is because because I have nothing to tell you. Some of you don't know me as well as others. I'm, I'm so normal, it hurts. I'm so fallen, it hurts. I've got so many problems, and I'm so weird at times that it blows my mind that God lets me do this. I can't tell you why God called me to this. I don't know. I'm thankful that he did because there's not a week. I'm telling you, I look forward to these times with you more than maybe any of you look forward to anything in your life. I love this. But in the midst of my love for it, you've got to know if you were coming here to hear my thoughts and opinions on things, that's not worth getting out of your car for. Do you understand me? It's sure not worth walking across the street for. It's not even worth getting out of bed for. And I would tell you that anyone who preaches anything other than the gospel founded on the word of God, it's not worth your time because it has no life-giving power. The reason that hopefully you're here is not to hear a preacher. It's to hear the word of God. What Paul is saying to Titus is this has everything to do with his teaching ministry because it's for the elect of God, the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, the preaching entrusted to him by 
by the command of God his Savior. You see, friends, the Bible has told us how we're to approach this. Jesus said it in John 17, 17. Sanctify them in the truth. And Jesus clarifies what the truth is. Thy word is truth. Thy word is truth. But even further than that, 1 Peter 2, 2, Peter commands, crave pure spiritual milk. We live in a world, in fact, Time Magazine, April 2017, cover story, Is Truth Dead? We live in a world that would tell you that truth, especially absolute truth, is dead. So when we say we are countercultural, we are completely countercultural. If you're looking for a church that's going to be in step with the world, you've come to the wrong one. You've come to the wrong church. And the reason is to be in step with the world, you've got to be out of step with God. To be in step with the world is to be in step with lies and falsehoods of the devil. To be in step with the world is to deny the absolute truth. No, we want to be the opposite of that. We want to be countercultural in a world that is full with deception and lies. We want to be founded on the truth. I hope that you're here not because you say we want to find a place where it looks a lot like the world, but hopefully you're here because you're saying we want to find a place that's totally, radically different from the lies and the deception of the world because we want the pure milk of God's truth and because of that it'll equip us to be saints and believers godly and holy grace that is greater than all of our sin driving us to love the Lord more and seek truth in our lives amen Paul says that all of this is resting verse 2 on the hope of eternal life he's already answered why he's here But then he answers where he is going and where we are going. This blessed assurance that gives encouragement for service and endurance. When he says resting on the hope of eternal life, biblical hope is absolute certainty of a future good. Oftentimes in modern culture, when we hear the word hope, it's kind of like a maybe. Well, we hope so. Y'all playing this weekend? Yeah, you think y'all are going to win? We hope so. That's not biblical hope. Biblical hope is an assuredness, an absolute certainty of future good. When I say that Christ is my hope of heaven, I'm not saying that I have a chance of getting there. I'm saying that he is the guarantee, the assurance, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a what? Foretaste of glory divine. That's not a word I use very often. What are we talking about when we use that word? We're saying that because I've experienced Christ now, that there is a foretaste, a foreshadowing that I know now because of what he's done in my life of what is coming. I'm not hoping I'm getting to heaven. If you're hoping just in a maybe sense that you're getting to heaven, I know I'm going to heaven. And because I know I'm going to heaven, that is the blessed assurance I have. This hope that Paul is talking about is what guides everything about people's lives. Friends, I would tell you, if you are saved, you don't need to die whether or not you're going to heaven. Hear me on this. Paul thought it was important enough to place it in the introduction. Many of you are living unproductive, unserving lives because you're constantly wondering whether or not you're truly redeemed. If you have asked Christ to forgive you of your sin, if you have believed that he died on the cross and that he rose on the third day, if you have repented, and this is key, made him the Lord, the master, the leader of your life and relinquished control of your life, then blessed assurance assurance. You have a hope that is strong and fast. Hebrews 6 says it is an anchor for your soul. Then friends, you need to know that that hope is not a maybe. It's secure in the arms of Christ our Savior. Resting on eternal life, identity, purpose, and convictions. Convictions, number three. Look at verses two through three. He says, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. And at his appointed season, he brought his word to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. First of all, here's conviction number one. It's a conviction about who God is. It's a conviction about who God is that, number one, God does not lie. 
that the faithfulness of God is essential to every other doctrine, that the promise of salvation came even before, the Bible says right here, the beginning of time, verse 2, and at the appointed season, that's the time in which he sent Christ to earth, when there was a common language, when there were roads that could be traveled, when the Pax Romana gave a peace over Rome so that the gospel could be spread. He revealed his word. Now, when you see that word, The word logos sometimes throughout Scripture is used in talking about Christ. But when it's talking about here, him revealing his word, he's talking about the message of Christ or the gospel, the gospel that is now going to be spread. We've talked about the age of lies in which we live. I meant to place my wallet in my pocket and I left it sitting on my desk. But if any of you have any paper money with you, and you were to take it out and you were to look at that money, dollar, five, twenty, hundred, whatever it is, whatever denomination, when you look at that money, you believe that it has that value, don't you? When you walk to the store and they tell you it's four ninety seven, you give them a five, you believe that you've covered it, correct? Why? Is the paper and the ink worth five dollars? No then why do you believe that it's worth that much? Why? This is kind of shocking when you think about it. It's because you trust the government. It's because you trust the government. The government has assigned a value to that, and the U.S. government is is backing that $5. So you believe every time you use currency, even for those of you who are conspiracy theorists and everything else, you believe that that money has value or you wouldn't walk up and open it up and give it to people to try to exchange it for goods. And you certainly wouldn't take it if you were the one selling something in an exchange for goods if you didn't believe that it was worth that, right? Right? Why is the Bible valuable? Here's here's the one I'm preaching from this morning. Why is it valuable? Is it because of the price of how much this leather on the outside of it cost? What about the paper inside? Is this where we get the value or the ink that was pressed onto the pages? Is that where the value is from? No. Why is it valuable? It's because I trust the one who wrote it. It's because I believe the promises of God that are contained within are valid. And when I open it up to read it, even more so than I trust that a $20 bill is worth $20, I should trust that the words about my salvation were written by the Almighty. And if some of you have no problem trusting that a $20 bill is worth $20, then that means you trust the federal government. Then you should have no trouble trusting the Word of God because you recognize recognize the authority of who is behind it because he's a God, what does Paul say? Who does not lie. His faithfulness that endures to all generations, that's said throughout the Psalms, God does not lie. And he, at his appointed time, allowed the word to be spread, the gospel to be spread. And then secondly, the conviction is not just about who God is, but Paul has convictions about the calling on his life. Notice what he says, verse 3, by the command of God our Savior. Paul's life was not his own. Paul would say, I had no choice. This calling was a compulsion. It was an obsession. In fact, he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. I can remember years ago in a quiet time reading 1 Corinthians 9, 16, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. And it was one of the times where I prayed more for God to protect my ministry and my reputation and my integrity than all other times. Certainly in honor and service to the Lord, I want to be faithful. But because of what God has placed on my own life, I think I understand in some small measure what Paul was talking about. That if something kept me from being able to preach the gospel faithfully, woe to me. Because I'm bound in that. And friends, you may not be called to be a preacher per se. 
But woe to you if you don't preach the gospel. It should be something that is so welled up inside of you that we keep talking about evangelism like it's a choice. And I'm wondering if we're teaching people wrong. Say people ought to have the overflow of the gospel in their life. Oh, please go evangelize. Please go talk to somebody about Jesus. Please bring Jesus up in a conversation. If you're truly saved, then when you introduce yourself, it shouldn't be, hey, I'm Larry LeBlanc. I've got three degrees, and I like fishing and hunting. My number one thing that ought to introduce myself ought to be that I ought to walk up to somebody, and it ought to be that within the first few moments of conversation, I tell them the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. I'm kind of tired of begging Christian people to evangelize. For Paul, it's the overflow. You, you, it's the overflow of what's happened in their life. That's what he's telling Titus. That's what he desires. He wants Titus's church to be like that. And then finally, number four, foundational element, discipling, discipling to Titus, my true son in our common faith. They weren't biologically related. In fact, Titus was a Gentile. Paul was a purebred Jew. So why does he say my true son? He loved Titus, and one of the reasons he loved him is that I'm very convinced that Paul led Titus to Jesus. And he says, he's my true son. He could have said, I baptize you, my little brother or my son, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Why? Because now they were family. And so when he says this, he's talking about this discipling ministry that he had with Titus. You see, when he loved Titus, he personally invested in him. That's always been how effective leaders have discipled. One-on-one, -on -one, one with a few or with several. That's how discipling takes place. And that's what he's encouraging Titus to do. Do what you learn from me. You know, we can think about it like this. You, you can remember maybe used to going to a, a local hardware store or a local auto parts place and you went in and you didn't have to necessarily know exactly what you were looking for or what you were doing because there was somebody there that would help you, right? You'd say, hey, look, I got this problem at the house and I don't know exactly what to do. And they'd walk you through it. They'd tell you what you needed and what you had. Now, what do we have? These big box chains that you walk in and you can't find anything. They've got probably more inventory, but nobody knows where any of it is. And they certainly don't know how to help you do the project. Thank God for YouTube, right? Church has kind of become like that, hasn't it? Hey, come to our big box store. We've got a big room and big lights and great music and an entertaining preacher and a lot of programs and great parking and great facilities. And yet, all the while, we've missed that all throughout Scripture, every time, Moses and Joshua, Eli and Samuel, Jesus and the apostles, Paul and Timothy and Titus, that it was all done through relationships, one-on-one -on -one relationships. That's not saying that you don't need to be here for the preached portion of God's Word and corporate worship, but people aren't being discipled just in large groups. We need people that are going to say, hey, come follow me. I'm not perfect, but I want to help you. I want to lead you. I want to pray for you. I want to guide you. I want to instruct you. I want to be there for you where we're breathing life one into another. We need men who are willing to disciple men and young men. We need women who are stepping up into other women's lives. There's, there's not a new way. The internet can't replace relationships. YouTube can't replace it. Social media can't replace it. Phones can't replace it. People need people. You need people and people need you. And probably throughout your life, I'm guessing that if you're a follower of Jesus, that somewhere along the way, somebody stepped into your life and they spent time with you and they loved you and they encouraged you and they shared with you and they put up with you. Right? Man, I'm glad God put patient people in my life. You know, I don't know where I'd be. I can tell you five people that should have given up on me. That idiot. I'm not fooling with him anymore. But thank God, and I mean that. They didn't give up on me. And some of you are like that. You're, you're breathing into people and you're growing and you're, you're doing what Titus did with 
Timothy, or what Paul did with Timothy and Titus. That's the way it's supposed to be. If, if you're a student leader, that's fantastic. It's not just about students. But if you're breathing the life of young people, that's great. But young people, as you get older, you've got to breathe in the life of some younger people that come behind you. That's the way it's built. And friends, I've got to tell you, these are foundations. All the things we've talked about today, everything on the screen behind me, those are foundations. If we get any of this wrong, we get it all wrong. These are absolute essentials to Paul about ministry, and they're going to be essential to First Baptist Church of Summit and its ministry. And so I'm asking you today, would you join with me in continuing to build a healthy church on the foundations of the power of the gospel and the promises of a God who does not lie? Would you be a part of something bigger than yourself? Would you be a part of a move of God, a gospel move, and join me today in saying, let's set the foundations right as we journey with God towards godliness and holiness. Let's stand together.